let's uh, begin with a word of prayer and I'll provide a little orientation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Lord, during this Lenten tide, we give you thanks that you have granted us your Holy Spirit in the waters of holy baptism in the hearing of your holy gospel. Stir your spirit within us, we pray. And in your entire church, O Lord, particularly in this Lutheran tradition, into faith and repentance, that we would walk in your ways to the glory of your name, for the good of our own souls and for the good of our neighbor. And bless now our study and conversations. Though that be seasoned with a bit of criticism, there's also plenty of construction here as well. Thank you for all those who are represented. We pray that your grace and peace would abide upon the mission in Eurasia. We particularly commend to you Kip and Tammy. We pray that you would have mercy upon them and grant your favor. And now, O oh Lord, uphold your church. Spread the fame of the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring glory to your name once again in and through this tradition that traces its heritage back to Luther, back to Augustine, back to St. Paul, and directly to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, by way of orientation, we have uh, three days together, three particular lectures. The first one is uh, going to talk about forging a sacramental culture. Uh, this is a lecture that I put together for uh, a talk in Atlanta and have modified for this occasion. And then the next two follow on, how do we forge a sacramental culture within Lutheranism, treating particularly the sacrament of Holy Communion and then the sacrament of confession and holy absolution. Now, why am I calling it the lost art of Lutheranism? Because there was once a time when the Lutheran church used to boast in the face of the Church of Rome that we celebrated the Mass, and I'm quoting Augsburg uh, Article 24, we celebrate, celebrate the Mass more frequently and with greater devotion than our opponents. That no longer can be said, and indeed it hasn't been able to be said for hundreds of years. And then so too, with the demise of the Sacrament of Holy Absolution, it being degenerated almost to the point of complete disuse in terms of private confession, um, that's a lost art and a profound pastoral tool as Harold Sankbeil has recently once again asserted and reestablished in his wonderful book, The Care of Souls. Now, in my file of the lost art of Lutheranism, I could have spoken on a whole host of different topics, everything ranging from the placement of national flags within the sanctuary, indeed flanking the altar or right by the baptismal font, or the disuse of incense, and a whole host of variety of other things, including iconography, uh, the proper veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, etc. But we're going to focus on these three because these are the most important. So we begin with our first lecture, Forging a Sacramental Culture. <clears throat> the Lutheran Church, it cannot be denied, has witnessed the free fall of infant baptisms and confirmations since the 1960s. And when you go to a baptism, it's a minimalist event, unaccompanied by any memorable ceremony. Their prescriptive, ho-hum occasions evoking a yawn. They go unmarked as a miracle happening. Likewise with First Communion. It's just that, merely the first one. They're not anymore a First Holy Communion because it is, just like the first one, pedestrian. No big deal. Usually pushed off until the child has entirely lost the eagerness and longing to commune with the living Christ. You know, like when they were six and seven, to now a disaffected and sometimes jaded age 13 or 14 adolescent teenagers, long past the time that psychologists have substantiated that a child's world viewing mechanisms are in place at ages six and seven, by which they would engage, interpret and understand the world. The entire time, that they would have really benefited from the power and profundity of receiving the healing, strengthening fruits of the Holy Cross, Jesus's body and blood. From the time of six and seven, no, 
Now at the age of 13 and 14, pastors have to slog through a half dozen years of skepticism, consumerism, and humanitarianism, indoctrination in secularism to try to convince that teenager that the body of Christ, a miraculous event that they've been banned from since the time of their miraculous baptism, is actually really present for them. So the church has actually kind of stiffed armed them away and have kept them away from that which they should have been receiving for the strengthening of their faith. And that now we have to work through detoxification to try to convince them that Christ is real and really present. Well, no wonder first communion occurs without invitations being sent out to families and friends to come and witness the remarkable bonding between the risen Christ and his child in and as the bread of life and the blood of the atonement. We don't send out those invitations. We'll send them out for high school graduation and a variety of other things, but not for First Holy Communion. Invitations to stay the weekend for the family feast and the toasting of Jesus Christ for his goodness and the Holy Spirit for illuminating the child in the truth. No, it's really no big deal. So why bother with all the fuss, all the expense, all the festivities? Instead, we thrust insecure middle schoolers in front of the congregation to receive, without requisite momentous celebration, the very thing that would have anchored, their, anchored them in the security that they needed throughout all the manifest changes of adolescence. First Holy Communions are gone. They've been lost. There's only sort of this blasé first communion with little to no fanfare. It's an affair of minimalism. Confirmations too have become almost extinct. They have virtually no cultural role or value within Lutheran families, little or no cultural role or value within Lutheran churches. They're not anticipated. They're not strongly desired. They are rarely discussed around the dinner table or amongst families, much less the leadership of the church. And when they do take place, again, with virtually no memorable ceremony or momentous celebration to hallmark the occasion, they quickly fade as a distant, never to be spoken of again occasion. No dress, no cake, no fuss, no expense, and when and where confirmations do happen, like several I've attended, it's hardly a big deal for the parents and hardly worth the drive for grandparents. No one else would be invited, certainly not friends and coworkers, employers or dignitaries from the community. No, nothing marks the occasion. Not even, and it is this particular car here. This is a, basically a resto mod E-Type because E-Type, a world famous car, but if you've ever driven one, they look beautiful, but they do not drive Sorry, well. are you able to this particular car. I mean, have a that look new? at that. So this is the Evolution E-Type. And this is the man here, Ulrich, who is responsible I just need to discover who he is. Tell me, right, I'm going to start. Then I think I found it. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so we're talking about um, confirmation occurring without requisite celebration and fanfare. So again, there's no fuss, no cake no expense. And when they do happen, hardly anyone is invited. You certainly would invite co-workers or employers or dignitaries for the occasion. There's not even a biblical pile of stones. They're utterly unremarkable, B-movie, low to no budget events in the life of families, low to no budget events in the life of the church. A speed bump perhaps in the harried life of soccer practices and Italian lessons. They come and go like a yawn with no one, no one in the outside world taking notice that holy communion has occurred or confirmation is being celebrated. And likewise, with the church celebrations of, of confirmation, indeed, even if the church celebrates the confirmation taking place in their midst, because most do not, 
it just happens as a perfunctory element of the divine service and something to be sped through so as not to extend the divine service any longer than it needs to. At the same time that there are fewer baptisms and confirmations, we have to acknowledge that Sunday school has collapsed. Outside of parochial schools, the church has lost almost all contact with children and teenagers. But then again, parochial schools are frequently chosen simply for the usually outstanding education that they offer, not necessarily for the Christian worldview that they purport to inculcate. And that's because catechesis doesn't matter much. Keeping the youth group fun and entertaining, well, that's what really matters. And when catechesis doesn't matter, then confirmation matters less. And when nothing matters, then, well, there's nothing to celebrate, which is why we're not having celebrations, certainly not public ones. With the collapse of the church culture for children, the church takes the blame for being irrelevant, and rightly so. Their church has, in large part, brought this dilemma upon herself. Rather than maintaining and extolling the features that distinguish the church from everything else, specifically celebrating the sacraments, the church has been monkeying entertainment culture of a consumerist society. Amusing kids has seems to have been the church's response. How can we keep them busy? How can we keep it light and fun? How can we make it undemanding? How can we make it without cost? It has to be a good time. Youth groups bear all the markings of entertainment culture. Hardly could the typical youth group be characterized as a serious study session or fortifying a gospel culture. Instead, you usually find a crazy best friend youth pastor cracking eggs on his head, throwing pizza parties, and giving kids the time of their lives until that time of their life is over and they go out the door usually at a rate of 90% from the church, never to come back. Church wasn't serious. Church wasn't serious or profound. When I was a kid, what would make it serious and profound as an adult? Now, I'm here to say that I'm no prophet, and I'm certainly not the son of a prophet, but I can tell you that it's supposed to be the sacraments that offer our young people their rites of passage for life and in life. Holy baptism, holy absolution in their first private confession, first holy communion, holy matrimony, and then at last the rite of Christian burial as the fulfilling sacramental act completing the circuit of holy baptism. You see, the Lord has given these as the mile markers and anchors for our personal identity in life to transition us from childhood into adulthood from comparative irresponsibility to responsibility, from consumption to stewardship. Now, however, the identity makers seem to be my first iPhone, launching my Instagram, getting my driver's license, and getting into the preferred college, which is then followed by achieving drinking age status. And this, let's be frank, is what children are looking forward to. It's what high schoolers look forward to. This is what they discuss when they're friends with their friends and family. This is what they celebrate because there is a culture already formed up around it, including the one acceptable obsession, if not idolatry in American society, at least. And I suspect it's the same throughout Europe. And that is a child's education. You can obsess about that. You can be idolatrous about it and it's fully accepted. Meanwhile, in the Lutheran church, there is a weak and flimsy sacramental culture, or better, a non-culture culture. Certainly so when compared to the Roman Catholic church and the Eastern Orthodox church. Pietism wounded it, anti-Catholicism exasperated it, competing extracurricular sports on Sunday, endangered it, and good old apathy has left our sacramental culture on life support. 
Some churches have already pulled the plug and just let it die. There is no sacramental culture. We have been absorbed into nondescript evangelicalism. Meanwhile, the polling data has evidenced the fact that throwing programs at youth is utterly ineffective. There's no indication that the decline in baptisms, church attendance, and confirmations has abated in recent years, even with a gush of youth pastors running around hosting pizza parties and pumping the pipeline with programs galore. This model doesn't work, and it can't work because there's nothing substantive there. Simply put, the Lord made no promises regarding pilgrimages to Disneyland and binge-watching Netflix in the way that he has done so with the sacraments. And the same could be said with respect to membership. Minimalism. The church seems to expect minimalism. Not costly discipleship. Not an internal transformation by the renewing of our mind through the word and the now largely absent sacraments. Now, I confess I was a so-called youth leader on the island of Kauai in the state of Hawaii for a couple of years, and I watched a huge youth group consume potato chips and throw back hot dogs. We had surf camps and dodgeball, and yet they never received a minute of catechesis toward confirmation, never received instruction toward First Holy Communion. There were no God-given rites of passage for them, identity-making markers in their life. There was no Christ-instituted sacraments that defined and secured the evolving identity of teens and kids. There was nothing that gave them being, permanence, and endurance. It was all rapidity, movement, fast, always becoming, never being, never stable, never at rest. And what I did see was the church give them exactly what they wanted to consume, which was fun, good fun. And, and we had lots of fun. We had a marvelous time. Any potentially heavy or serious moment, any substantive doctrinal or, or a discussion about theology was translated into categories of cool and, and make it quick too. No good Friday stuff going on here. Let's keep it light and keep it trite to keep their attention. Actually, it, it, it was an indoctrination course. We taught them what to expect from the church, to have it your way, when you want it, how you want it, fun, unserious, low commitment, low expectations. It was indoctrination. And what is more, they were cut off from the adults isolated from the wisdom pool of the seniors in the congregation, unfamiliar with the dignified worship of the corporate body of Christ. The youth were shuffled off to youth church, presumably to engage the youth God. We taught them well. And when it was time to get serious about their faith, you know, like when they started having sex and trying drugs and becoming confused about their identity, they simply left the faith because they did not recognize the seriousness of it. They had never been in a culture of seriousness. Their fun faith offered them nothing when life wasn't fun. They turned to society's rites of passage, birth control pills, independence through automobiles, and they were justified. Oh, justification was important but they were justified by the same society to try and find themselves, discover who they really were. And in this, they were justified in their behaviors. Meanwhile, parents stood on the catechetical sidelines calling in plays to youth pastors who quite frankly, were too busy trying to keep their theologically disinterested kids amused. So my point is this, programs don't work. That's not what the Lord bequeathed to the church. That's not our culture. A recent study by Pew suggests that young people are more alienated from the church than ever. And this is why I saw my role in the parish not to entertain children, much less adults, but to baptize them, to catechize them, to commune them, to speak to them as if they were adults. 
to include them in the studies with the adults. They didn't need me to be their crazy best friend. My role actually was minor to that of the parents. I was a mere catalyst for what parents were to do in their homes 24 seven. Christ our Lord intends for the home to be the catechetical epicenter, equipped and fortified by the church and her clerics. The church and her clerics teach congregations, teach the people of God sound doctrine and practice, and then they teach it back. They echo it again. They catecheo it with their children. You see, it's a catechetical loop, reinforcing a particular kind of culture full of substance, meaning, and rites of passage. Again, they don't need me to be their crazy best friend or a youth pastor for that matter. They need a serious pastor who is zealous as Christ was for his sheep, for they are his sheep and pastors are his under shepherds. They need a serious and learned and able pastor. This is why they need you. And they need dad and they need mom and they need grandmother and grandfather to extol and embrace for themselves the importance and necessity of spiritual formation and knowledge and practice and service and to bring their kids along in this way of truth and righteousness. They need parents and grandparents to make a big deal about their baptism, about their communing with Christ and about their being confirmed and encouraged toward holy matrimony with a faithful Christian, preferably Lutheran spouse, and to have children themselves. That's to say, they need you to have expectations. They need you to generate a sense of anticipation, to talk about it around the dinner table, and to reference these sacraments throughout their young lives and into their adult lives when, on occasion, they lose their minds. The sacraments are anchors for them in identity. The sacraments are anchors in reality. They give a sense of permanence and endurance. They promote security and sanity. And once these same children are confirmed by way of serious and demanding catechesis, they need you to bring them to adult Bible studies. They need you to bring them to adult Bible studies with you. Classes with meaty theology and substantive Bible study, with cultural critique and reflection, poised at deeper learning so that they stay anchored for life throughout life. That's the making of a sacramental culture. You should expect it to be present in your churches. You should expect it to be present in your homes. You should require it of your clergy. This was the art of Lutheranism. This is what made it a profound cultural and global force in the 16th and 17th centuries. Help your pastors, and if you are pastors, forge a sacramental culture and recover the lost art of Lutheranism. I seem to think that all you're going to get from a serious catechist in the way of a youth group stuff is a program to forge family togetherness. So think about it. If you are being serious and, and you have a youth group that's about the family, then it's going to forge family togetherness. Have family youth events, bonfires with the parents, beach days with the parents, hikes with the parents, pumpkin carving, advent decorating, the children and the family doing these things together within the culture of the church community. You see, you're invited because catechesis is all about what you do in the home. It's not another drop-off activity for which you pay a league fee that goes to the coach. You're the coach when it comes to catechesis and forging a sacramental culture in your household or parish. The pastor is really like the general manager who provides for the team needs with the message and vision for the coaches. The family church events, be they 
youth oriented or full blown celebrations of the sacraments and rites of passage evidence that you and your children and your family are not alone in the world, that we are in this together, that we have support mutual support from parents with different gifts and abilities and perspectives and challenges and successes. Indeed, celebrating a sacramental culture exclaims that we are Lutheran Christians to the world, the evangelical Catholic Church, that we have conserved the tradition and the tradition is stable, enduring, meaningful. That that what is important to us and among us is celebrated. That which is important to us and among us is valued, extolled, hallmarked, anticipated, reverenced, punctuated, it's grand. Or it is not. And if it is not, oh, believe me, that is communicating quite loudly to the church to the children and to outside culture. I would encourage pastors to make no grand effort to preach and teach much during those events, those celebrations I'm talking of, because that's not the point. Rather, it is about the church acting as a catalyst for you to center your lives around the church, around the people of God, around the word and the sacraments that make us the family that we are. So let the rites be momentous. Let them be miraculous. This is the way of the Lord. Let your children, the children who are under your custody, and, and, and by your making a big deal of every baptism, every first Holy Communion, every confirmation, every celebration of holy matrimony, that we are taking a stand against the intrusion of consumerism within our church and setting a line of demarcation between ourselves and soul-sapping consumerism and secularism. We are setting good and holy and godly rites of passage for you and for your children to anchor their identity, their lives, their hopes, their help in the world. We are forging a different culture, or at least we ought to be aspiring to do so. A different culture, and this culture will not lose hold of the centrality of the gospel sacraments that make us the alternative to consumer culture. We are the justified. We are the regenerated. Christ has made us his own, and he has given us of his own, the Holy Spirit. And we all need to hear that. Your kids should hear that too. I do want to remind you that there was a time when the Lutheran church used to boast in the face of the Church of Rome that we celebrated the Mass more frequently and with greater devotion than our opponents. But alas, that, that can hardly be said today. Why? We have lost that culture. We have lost the sacramental culture. And that sacramental culture was at the heart of the art of Lutheranism. I'm a... I am broken as a pastor when I see the baptized who were once in our midst, now unfamiliar with the sacrament of Holy Communion. When I see them as strangers to the interior of the church, feeling awkward among those who sign the cross, who forget any set prayers, including the Lord's Prayer, as well as the creeds and the great hymns of our holy faith, that that hurts me. It grieves me, and it leaves me with a sense of guilt, seeing that their baptism has made little difference for their life and their experiencing, that their first Holy Communion was so unremarkable that it left no mark upon their future, that their confirmation, if indeed there was one, held all the significance and identity-making for them as the transition maybe from first grade to second grade. It was a blip on the radar of life. Now, I, I do want to pause here and just speak theologically for a moment. I hope that we can appreciate that the biblical doctrine of holy baptism, which is retained in our confessions, is far more robust than the Roman Catholic view of baptism. The Roman Catholic Church has a much lower view of baptism. 
it isn't nearly as efficacious or as extensive. It certainly isn't justifying in the same way as the Lutheran. That's to say the biblical understanding of holy baptism. They actually have a downgraded form of the doctrine of holy baptism. And yet a profound culture around holy baptism because it is accompanied with ritual and ceremony and celebration. We have lost all of those things that communicate the grandeur, the miracle that's taking place in holy baptism. Likewise with holy communion. We recognize that as the power of the word of God and the efficacy of the Holy Spirit at the time of consecration where the ever incarnate Lord is now manifest on altars. This should be ceremonially celebrated, full of ritual. But we have stripped it down through pietism and through an incipient anti-Catholicism when Lutheranism had come over from Europe into North America and found Calvinists and Roman Catholics, but to distance themselves from Roman Catholicism began to take on the outward accoutrements of the Calvinist manifestation of, of the service. That was decidedly anti-cultural. It was part of the losing of the art of Lutheranism. Now more can be said on that, but for many, many we know, Christianity is a free-floating and abstract phenomenon that bears no discernible relation to anything tangible in their everyday lives. Most will not recall their baptisms. There'll be no pictures hanging in the house, no locket, no particular cross or crucifix given on that occasion. They might even have a baptismal gown that's been retained or passed on from generations to generations. So there is no recollecting of it. They will never have been confirmed and will have experienced the church only as small children in a way that's appealing only to small children. And so it's no wonder that so many grow out of Christianity at the same time that they grow out of belief in Santa Claus. The celebration of the gift consuming is done with far more planning and, and purpose in our consumer society than the first Holy Communion and confirmation of children, let alone the purposeful planning of holy matrimony. God forbid that the expectations are higher in our culture, that the anticipation is greater and the conversation more sustained about irreligious winter festivals than the very application of the sacraments to those that we love most. We've got to put things into proper perspective. Let us render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Now, I just want to say parenthetically here and by way of personal antidote, I have a 17 and 15 year old daughters as well as 13 year old and an 11 year old son. Well, my daughters, especially the older ones who've never been on a date and let me tell you, they're beautiful and interesting and godly and intelligent. They desire holy matrimony. And this has come as a result of following the rites of passage in their lives, which were sacramental celebrations, landmarks for them. Their holy baptism, their identity anchored in Christ Jesus. The first time that they had engaged in private confession and received holy absolution, prior to their first Holy Communion, and then their first Holy Communion, replete with white dress and tiara, a, a diadem virtually, and then huge community-wide celebration, relatives coming in from across the country, and then confirmation, the same sort of um, explosive celebration for the entire community, bringing together the resources of the dozen or more families that had confirmands that year to throw a big party for the whole congregation to celebrate. It was a big affair. And because these were landmark occasions in their lives, they are eager and looking forward to not living with their shacked up love, honey, not a whole string of different men. They're looking forward to finding that Christian man in which to share in holy matrimony and to begin that cycle afresh with their own children. It has to be forged 
within a sacramental culture. Now, mind you, all of this that has been said has been with hardly any reference to holy absolution, which itself is all but an, a bygone relic of past generations. Never has a sacrament been more neglected or perceived to be more valueless. It's kind of unwanted. It's like the ugly stepchild of the six chief parts of Luther's small catechism. I can hardly find a Lutheran pastor carrying out private confession and holy absolution, let alone posting established hours for making confession. And yet, in terms of pastoral care, this may be the most poignant tool in our arsenal. Again, I commend to you Harold Sankbile's wonderful book where he pleads with pastors to recover this lost art. Now, admittedly, the church is in an impossible situation. Having frequently failed to form parents or now grandparents, it can no longer rely on them to raise their children within a worshiping community, unless, of course, it's fun with an awesome youth group. The faith of those children must often now be something of a distant legacy of perhaps grandparents who once believed, attended, and served. In other words, their association, the, a child's association to the church is usually by proxy. Grandma attends church and she does so for dad and by extension for me, I guess, whatever. When parents do not perceive the church as a priority and the church has not made the sacraments a necessary priority in the lives of families, then church will not be a priority in the lives of their children. It's that simple. And it's always been that simple. Likewise, with respect to family priorities, the call of Jesus Christ takes priority over the game schedule of the soccer coach. How could how could it be otherwise unless the idea of community or my kid on the traveling team becomes the object of devotion? Well, let's speak constructively now. What's the answer? Well, here's the answer. Recovering the lost art of Lutheranism. Forging once again a sacramental culture. It was once an art within confessional Lutheranism, so let it be so again, and it can be done. With resources abounding in the defense and the promotion of Lutheran sacramental life and devotion, we've got, we've got resources galore constantly being published on this, papers being given, YouTube videos all about this wonderful sacramental life and devotion. We are well down the road to doing it already in terms of resources, but we're far from having yet arrived. And beyond that, influencing sister churches around us. Parents, as well as parishioners and pastors, need to be mindful not to borrow from consumer culture in order to appeal to children and families when it comes to being formed in Christ. Holy baptism, private confession, and holy absolution. First Holy Communion, confirmation, and holy matrimony are not merely special events to be enjoyed within a consumer culture, a kind of special mourning for the family, but with no wider significance or enduring meaning. All of these events within your home should be constantly referenced, frequently revisited, and used as guiding lights in your instruction, encouragement, and discipline of your children. Remind them of the virtues that were put into them. Remind them of the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit given to them at the font full of all Christian virtues. Bless them with the knowledge that they are of great value to the Lord and objects of his love. Have them participate in these celebratory events by actually doing things in preparation and participation. What they should not think is that these holy markers exist in their lives as one of a variety of extracurricular youth activities along with soccer, gymnastics, and the circus. What confessional Lutherans, especially pastors and elders of the church, could and should do in a more conscious and concerted way is celebrate. Making use of your fellowship halls, your courtyards, your outdoor spaces, and publicly celebrate. You can do this. Of course, you can expect 
that here the, the sacraments and confirmation will be referenced and mentioned time and again by pastors and the deaconess and catechists. Bring all that talk home. The Lord purchased and saved our children and grandchildren with his blood, with his very life, so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. An, abundant, an abundance of life in that which is true and good and pure and holy, not in the abundance of things at which they possess. So extol their status of being justified. Praise their being baptized. Honor their participation in Holy Communion and don't wait until they are, you know, the better part of a decade removed from their basic interpretive framework for inter understanding the world. Make a big deal that they have been dutiful in their studies and service as a catechumen for their first Holy Communion in their experience of holy absolution. And yes, as a confirmand for confirmation and do so in a way in which you yourselves have come to anticipate and appreciate how these truths are more enduring and more powerful identity makers than the school that they attend or will attend. They will always be a Christian, but they will not eternally be an undergraduate of this or that university put the priorities right. Allow them the freedom to enjoy being self-identified as Christians basking in their justification and redemption by Jesus Christ. Pastors, we have a culture. Develop strategies and rituals and customs around the exaltation and celebration of sacramental rites. Don't let them pass with perfunctory mindlessness as if utterly routine and mundane. Rather, accentuate the miraculousness of holy baptism and holy communion. Magnify the healing, restorative, and settling power of holy absolution. And let confirmation be about baptism coming to fruition in the identity-confirming confession of children and even young adults. Holy matrimony and funeral rites should take it all to an even higher level. A rite of transition, renaming, all of these profound identity-making events. We have a sacramental culture, a church community that revolves around the sacraments of Christ and the blessed sacraments of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. This heritage is the church's rightful heritage. This identity is our identity. This history is our history. These people are our people. And all of this by the grace and goodness of God. Now that's something to celebrate. Let the sacraments spill over into public, visible, detailed-oriented, meaningful celebrations Grace given, grace maturing. Now take the lead and forge a sacramental culture within your own home, within your own church, and your collective Christian lives.